but number one, exercise. And this one should come as no surprise to all of you who follow the podcast, have listened to me and listened to the podcast that I've done. Uh, when it comes to stress, resiliency, and adaptation, exercise is a form of stress inducing or, or, or induct. In, in, I was trying to think of a good word for that. It induces stress. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. Stress in and of uh, sorry, exercise in and of itself is indeed a stressor, but it is a hormetic stressor. It is a stressor that is made to help build us back bigger, faster, and stronger. And we know that from research and from the literature, there is probably nothing out there that has been found to be as potent as a change agent for stress resiliency, for affecting overall health and well-being and performance than consistent exercise. So let's talk about what I do in regards to exercise and why it's so incredibly valuable and important for stress resiliency. So the first thing I do is I always start my day with a quality walk in the sun. Now, I say that, but I also do that a little bit later in my morning. I kind of say that's a good kickstart to the day. So for a lot of people who aren't waking up at 5 a.m. like I am and getting to the gym, you know, around 6 a.m. or so uh, when the sun's not out yet, that if you are waking up and the sun is either coming up or has already uh, risen, then it's great to go ahead and get a quality walk out in the sun, move, engage in optic flow, look at the surroundings around you. It's an amazing way to enhance cardiovascular functioning, an amazing way to get some good vitamin D and some good sunlight and really reset their circadian rhythm for the, for the, for the next evening uh, and, and improve the next evening sleep. We always say that good quality sleep starts as soon as you wake up. And I really, really believe that. So what I do is I typically uh, will start my day with a walk. However, a lot of times I'll be at the gym first before the sun's even out and I'll be doing either a resistance training or zone two training, which I'll be talking about here in a second. Uh, but I think that if you are in one of those positions where you're not hitting the gym the first thing in the morning, because I'm not saying you have to, everybody's gym routine can look different and it doesn't matter if you go in the morning or if you go in the afternoon, uh, you know, we could argue about peak times for testosterone and human growth hormone, but the best form of exercise is the one that you get done and you, and you get completed. So I don't want to, you know, I don't want to split hairs too much about this one. But for me, but if you're not getting in the gym, I would say first thing you should do is just get out and get a quality walk, get movement, wake up the body, get out in the sun. That's a great first step. For me, I'm generally in the gym now around 6, 630 in the morning, and I am doing uh, one of two things or both things at once. No, I'm not at the same time. <laughs> I say uh, both things in the same session. The first would be good quality resistance training, weight training, plyometric training, uh, could be a Metcon, anything that helps you to build strength or muscle and or muscular endurance. So for me, it could be a good uh, free weight routine where I'm utilizing things like progressive overload and increasing the volume and sets and weight to make sure that I am indeed getting stronger. I am indeed providing uh, uh, confusion and, and mystery almost to the muscles so that we can build and regain kind of that, um, that power and that strength and that endurance. We know from multiple research studies that resistance training outside of endurance training, resistance training can be extremely, extremely effective for improving mental well-being. So can we see things like a reduction in depression, a reduction in anxiety, a, redu a reduction in stress. And then also too, we see things like a reduction in overall pain response, which can be very much connected to autonomic nervous system functioning and to the human stress response. All of these are whole benefits with resistance training alone. So I would say that finding a good resistance training program is extremely important. You want to know my go-to guy, Ben Pakolsky. So if you're interested in good routines, uh, good uh, means for enhancing mindset around resistance training, listen to Ben Pakolsky's podcast, the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I think you'll find so much inherent value from that podcast. It's an incredible one that I go to. It's my go-to, um, and he's a good personal friend of mine who I ask stuff from all the time. Um, but great stuff for resistance training. Um, also, his website is, is incredible as well. 
Uh, there's also plenty of other individuals that I look to that I really like their routines for weight training or resistance training. Ben Greenfield, obviously another really good one to, to go to as well. The other thing I do is zone two training and zone two cardio has been uh, talked about a lot within the past year, two years, three years or so. Uh, it's kind of hard to keep track of time with the pandemic and everything. I don't even know what year it is. I mean, feels like my both my kids were just born and now they're like legit kids in school, which is weird. Uh, but zone two training is an extremely popular one for good reason. Not because it's easy or it's hard. It's just found to be effective for increasing uh, mitochondrial output, uh, for increasing vagal output and vagal flow. Zone two training is something that I do weekly. And when I say weekly, I should almost say daily. Um, it is, uh, I typically will do zone two training anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour, four to five times a week. And I realize that's a lot, um, but I enjoy it. I absolutely enjoy it. And as far as resistance training goes, that's about four to five days a week as well. Zone two training, what does it look like? Well, it can look very different for everybody. Uh, one of the greatest podcasts that I've heard about this, um, there's two podcasts that were done by Dr. Peter Atia and Inigo San Milan, um, who is an amazing world-class cyclist coach uh, who uh, I believe is uh, tenured out of the um, University of Colorado, I want to say. And these podcasts are really interesting because they break down the science and physiology behind changes that occur with zone two and why it's so important to stay within that zone for a period of time. Uh, we say that to start off, I like the idea of three to five times a week at 30 to 45 minutes. But where we also start to see even more benefits for highly trained individuals is that 45 minutes to an hour time frame. What do I normally do for zone two? I'm either going to run or I'm going to bike. Those are my two go-tos. So the great thing about doing them indoors is that I can track wattage output on the bike. I can track heart rate very easily too. Um, you can do that really anywhere, um, you know, with a really high quality heart rate monitor like Hanus, though we don't specifically focus on zones. We really are looking at heart rate for the stress response. But zone two um, can be uh, measured by either heart rate can be measured by lactate, or it can be measured by subjective experience, which is a little bit uh, tougher to do. However, I like this test, and it's easy for anybody to really find out like what what the what their range is is by doing this. Can you talk or hold a conversation while you're engaging in that exercise? And it's going to feel a little strainful. It's almost at the peak of like, oh, yeah, this is super uncomfortable. I don't know if I could do it anymore. But that's the general test. As long as you can hold a conversation, though it may be quite strained, you may not be able to think very, very uh, extremely clear during that time. Can you do it? That's that's a good, uh, you know, RPE, if you will, for zone two. The other things that I like to do in regards to exercise is just walking. Walking in general has been demonstrated over and over and over again to be extremely effective means for reducing stress and helping us to better adapt to stress. And again, walking technically is a stressor. Um, we are putting stress on the body. It is eustress. It is a form of good, quote unquote, so-called good stress but walking is an incredible one. I aim for generally eight to 10,000 steps a day, uh, typically in like the 12 to 15,000 steps per day. Uh, but research really doesn't demonstrate a significant effect beyond about eight to 10,000 steps. Um, so that is just kind of me wanting to move more and not really doing it because I think it holds any additional benefit. But walking, split your day up, move throughout the day, take like Pomodoro breaks. So like, let's say every 25 minutes, get down, do some push ups, go for a walk, you know, do some pull ups, do some crunches. Those are things, air squats, those are things that can be extremely effective and important throughout your day to get the blood flowing, help you to engage in that small bout of hormetic stress so that you can indeed build resiliency so that when other stressors you encounter are in kind of your, or throughout your day, you have that ability to adjust and adapt accordingly. So I really like exercise as one of my top daily stress resiliency habits.
Thanks for listening to the Hanu Health Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. This podcast would not happen without listeners and supporters like you. And the best way to support us and the show is to head on over to iTunes and provide us with a five-star review. This helps us reach others and spread the good word of breathing and stress resiliency. If we read your five-star review on air, please reach out to podcast at hanuhealth.com with your name and mailing address, and we will send you some sweet Hanu gear. Until next time, breathe better and stress less.